So now we know kind of what's behind all of this information that we're looking at in the Proterozoic. And so now we're going to move on to fossils and fossil preservation. So we've had the the appearance of life, we've had the first stromatolites, we've had the Ediacaran fauna, and we're just about getting ready for the Cambrian explosion. So the next step along the way is not the Cambrian explosion, but in fact it is fossils and fossil preservation. So we're going to look at that just briefly. So if you look at this first image here, I spent a little bit of time on this, um, on the upper right there, that's actually a local fossil around here. It is a series of worm tubes in Chert. And it's a rock that I, okay, I have a rock tumbler. So I thought, man, this would make some really cool looking rocks. And so I polished it. And those are worm tubes. And so the worm tubes in that rock probably represent some sort of methane seep. And so they're in the Reed Spring Formation which is in McDonald County in Missouri. If you're familiar with Missouri at all, it is the southwesternmost county in the state. Uh, so it is preserved by being silicified, like fossil wood, right? So like like uh, what we call petrified wood, right? So it's the same sort of stuff, okay, except this time it's petrified seafloor, essentially, that was there. And it was pretty much um, facilitated by the fact that there were methane seeps in that area. That's a long story, and I don't want to get into that, but at the same time, it's like it's a pretty cool rock, and it makes a beautiful polished stone. Um, in the lower part, in this panel across the bottom here, you can see a dinosaur footprint. That is a type of fossil, in fact, right? So it's a type of fossil. In fact, we have a special category for it. We call them trace fossils, in fact. In the middle part here, you can actually see the bones of a triceratops. And so the triceratops are, uh, are a variety of things that were preserved with their original hard parts. Okay, you don't get any of the fleshy parts or anything like that. No organs are around, at least not in this specimen. And, uh, and so that is another type of preservation, in fact. So very, very rapidly this thing would have been buried at some point and then preserved in the sediments uh, in its natural sort of like bony structure if you will it's made out of calcium phosphate that's what bones are made out of in the left hand side then is a cephalopod so cephalopods are a type of mollusk now if you're not familiar with it cephalopods are like uh, would include things like uh, octopus and squids and other sorts of uh uh, sort of seagoing creatures, if you will, um, and then Nautilus was the uh, is the one that's living today, where we actually have a skeleton associated with it. It's an exoskeleton, a shell that surrounds it, spiral shell, and so that is a type of cephalopod here, and it, in fact, has been preserved as well. In this case, they're typically made out of aragonite, but aragonite can go through a process and actually commonly be recrystallized as calcite and so it's hard to know exactly what that is but i think it's probably calcite in that uh, in that example so let's move on what are fossils fossils by definition are the preserved remains or traces of organisms from a past geologic age it's as simple as that whether they're trace fossils or body fossils we call everything that as the shell or the hard parts that's a body fossil but the things, the behaviors that are left behind by these creatures, the burrows, the tracks, the borings, all sorts of those types of behaviors, those are called trace fossils. So we're going to get to that. Uh, Subfossil material would be things like you would find at a seashore. And so those would be the shells and things like that. They're not preserved as fossils. They were actually just recently living and have deceased and are left behind in places where you can find them, essentially. So... Um, yeah, any beach is going to have some seashells on it, right? So you'll see uh, some examples of subfossils in that sort of setting. So they're not quite old enough, in other words. And so how old do they have to be? Well, there's not a hard and fast rule, but a lot of people say about a thousand years, maybe, something like that. And so, um, yeah, so that's what it is. So fossils versus subfossils. Um, there are many disciplines that study fossils because fossils give us the record of what happened in ancient life. Paleontology is the one you may be familiar with, and so paleontology, we actually offer a course in that at Missouri State, 
Uh, if you were to go to Britain, you would call it paleontology as well, but they spell it slightly differently here. So I put that in parentheses in the presentation that accompanies this presentation here. And you can see it on the screen, in fact, here. Uh, it's a study of ancient life. So paleontology is a study of ancient life and how things would have actually interacted uh, with their environment, I guess you could say as well. And there's another study that deals with that as well. That's called paleobiology. So paleobiology is a branch of paleontology that specifically addresses the life habits and the patterns uh, that we see expressed in, in fossil materials. Uh, ichnology and ethology are the study of trace fossils, or also you could call it the study or the, of the behavior of animals. And so in the past, uh, ichnology is usually what we refer to as the study of trace fossils. And so that's the most common usage in geology anyway. Ethology would be more commonly used in biology, I guess you could say. Uh, paleoecology is the study of interactions between ancient organisms and their environment. Uh, so how are things preserved and so forth? That's, that actually falls into a category we call taponymy, which is kind of linked with paleoecology. Ecology would deal more with what were the water conditions like? What was the... Uh, the sort of environment that this creature lived in. And so if you, for instance, you found a, a dinosaur, was it a desert dwelling dinosaur? Or was it a swamp dwelling dinosaur? Did it live in the shallow oceans perhaps, you know, or in the coastal areas? Was it a swimming reptile perhaps? And so uh, those are the sort of things that you would look at in paleoecology. When we look at the actual preservation or the way that things are preserved in their natural environment where they would have would have become deceased and then got buried at some point and then preserved. Uh, that's called taphonomy. And so taphonomy is the study of the decayed remains, how things will actually break down through time and then become preserved as fossils. So I've already made an allusion to this. What are the two types of fossils? Those are called body fossils or the trace fossils that are left behind from the behaviors of these sorts of animals. And so we can have the original body parts, like the shells, the exoskeletons, the bones and other things, or even pieces of the animal would constitute part of a fossil. You don't have to have the complete animal in order to be preserved as a fossil. Um, and there's a whole variety of other things that could be preserved as fossils, right? There are other ways that we preserve fossils as well. Sometimes materials will come in, like I've already talked about silicification. We talk about petrified wood, right? Well, petrified wood, wood does not grow as silica. Okay, so it may have a little tiny bit of silica in it, but in fact, on a molecular scale in the pore fluids in which a piece of petrified wood or a piece of wood would have been preserved, buried in the sediments, water comes through and actually replaces some of that cellular structure one molecule at a time and then takes that cellular structure and kind of mimics it, I guess you could say. And so that's what petrified wood would be. It's been silicified. And so silicification is one of the things that you get with petrified wood, and it's one of the things you commonly get with chert. Now, chert is commonly called cryptocrystalline quartz. In other words, it's hidden crystals. They're so tiny you can hardly see the crystals, and so that is what comes in in the molecular sort of scale to replace some fossils. Um, that silicification is that process. It's a type of permineralization. Another type would be pyrite. Uh, creatures don't grow with pyrite skeletons, not very commonly anyway. There's only one variety I could think of that might pick up a little tiny piece of pyrite in the subsurface I can think of, but that would be an agglutinated foram, and you don't need to know that, but uh, you can take up pieces and actually make a skeleton out of pieces of sediment, and that's what they do. But when I talk about pyritized Animals, we're usually talking about a molecular scale, again, a replacement with Fe2S uh, as the mineral that comes in and replaces that shell, perhaps. Uh, very commonly, it happens in brachiopods, which are originally made out of calcite, but then the pyrite comes along and replaces the calcite. Uh, so permineralization. There's another one that's called phosphatization. So you can take phosphat, uh, phosphatic sort of uh, molecules and come in and replace pieces of a shell as well. Uh, recrystallization commonly occurs, particularly with things that are made out of aragonite. Aragonite is a polymorph of calcite. Calcite is uh, 
calcium carbonate. It's CaCO3 is the chemical formula for it, or uh, but that's the same chemical formula, in fact, for aragonite. But aragonite, if it is left long enough, it's metastable, and it will actually recrystallize into calcite. And then lastly, the trace fossils. They're the tracks, the trails, the marks, and the sedimentary rock that record the behavior of animals. Uh, so there's some rarer types of preservation as well. Um, you can get inclusions in amber, for instance. They've recently found fungi in, uh, inside of amber growing on mushrooms. And there were little tiny mushrooms that were growing on something that had died in, and had been incorporated or encapsulated in uh, amber. Amber is essentially uh, tree sap. And so tree sap actually surrounds things like insects, maybe wasps, flies, things like that. And so if you ever find any place that sells amber, be very skeptical because you can actually kind of imitate amber in some unusual sort of ways. And so be very careful how you buy jewelry that's uh, amber jewelry. But you can find things like algae, you can find insects, fungi, all sorts of things like that in amber. Amber they find very commonly in the uh, Car Caribbean uh, area and then like around Dominican Republic, I think is pretty famous for its amber. And then also in the uh, Baltic regions because there's a lot of pine trees there, right? So anything that could like land in the tar that's seeping out of a pine tree could be preserved at some point in amber. Most of the amber that we find is fairly recent. Most of it's Cenozoic in age. So, you know, 65 million years or younger. But the oldest amber that anybody's ever found was actually, it dates back to the Pennsylvania. Uh, so it goes way back 300 million years. Pretty amazing, actually. Uh, in the Arctic, they occasionally find the remains of a mammoth and mammoths, and they may even retain their stomach contents. So it'll actually be the fur on, the, the muscles that have been preserved and so forth. And they do find that. And so you can actually, they have sequenced, I'm pretty sure they have anyway, mammoths that were actually preserved in the permafrost in the Arctic regions. Now, mammoths did not go extinct as long ago as you might have thought. Okay, so the last glacial maximum was about 20,000 years ago. And about 10,000 years ago, the there was a great melting of many of the glaciers and uh, but they're even younger than that. Some of them existed all the way into about 5,000 years ago in a little tiny island in the Arctic called Wrangell Island. And so it's off the coast of Siberia, in fact. So um, that's where they find some of these mammoths that are frozen. That's a type of preservation as well. Uh, there's soft body preservation as well. You've already seen some of that. Well, not a lot, but you've seen maybe a, uh, some indication. Anyway, you can get things that are preserved as impressions. But you can, like in the Ediacaran fauna, right? Those mostly are almost like trace fossils, if you will, because there's a burial that goes along with that, and it leaves behind the impression of that animal. Most of those animals, of course, were soft-bodied animals, and so they get preserved as impressions. The other type of soft-body preservation occurs in, in places like the, the, uh, the Burgess Shale. The Burgess Shale is absolutely famous for its fossil content. And I'm gonna, you're going to see some of that when we talk about the Cameron explosion. Uh, in fact, you're going to see a lot of it. <laughs> and, and then also the Solenhofen limestone. So those are two places where you actually see impressions. Plus, you get some of these organic films that are there. So you see things like feathers preserved on ancient birds, for instance, like Archaeopteryx. So that's the Solenhofen limestone in Germany. Uh, the Burgess Shale is actually from Canadian Rockies. And so the Canadian Rockies have this incredible fauna that dates back all the way to the Cambrian. It's one of the best ways that we know about Cambrian fossils, in fact. Um, also, one unusual type of fossil that we have are coprolites. Coprolites are fossil poop, okay? Um, there's no other easy way to put it to you, so fossil poop, if you will. Gastroliths are the other type of fossil. Gastroliths are in the gizzards of dinosaurs, okay? So of dinosaurs, when they wanted to grind up their food, and many of them were plant eaters and things like that, they would swallow stones and put it into their gizzard that would help them crush the things that they were eating. And so gastro gastroliths are found in special circumstance where they find polished stones, essentially, that are incorporated around the skeletons of the fossils. And, and so that's kind of neat that way. So those are called gastroliths or stomach stones. 
Um, so if we look for examples for the body fossils, the trilobites are some of the first ones that come into uh, into mind for me anyway, and so I've made maybe for many of you as well. In paleontology, we think about trilobites as being the first vestige of abundant life on this planet. And so we talk about the Cambrian explosion. Well, the Cambrian explosion occurred slightly before the first trilobites sh showed up, but not very far before that. So maybe 20 million years before the trilobites showed up. And they showed up about 530, 540 million years ago. So, um, so here we have some trilobites preserved right here. This is a trilobite that actually made the news here recently. Um, if you look on the left-hand side here, you can actually see phacops. It's a Devonian trilobite. Um, it had compound eyes like a fly has, in fact. And so it became the inspiration, in fact, for looking at cameras that can actually have a, an extreme deep field focus, essentially. It's kind of neat. So that is a type of trilobite, in fact. They all had compound eyes, as far as we know. And the lenses in their eyes were actually made out of transparent calcite. Kind of neat. Um, on the right-hand side is one of the earliest trilobites. Now, that's Paradoxides. Uh, the very earliest, this is... This is maybe warm, maybe a few million years after the first trilobites have occurred, but um, th this is Paradoxides from the Cambrian over here. So that's what the earliest trilobites would have looked like. And surprise, they weren't that small, actually. Uh, uh, Paradoxides, these things could be up to like 10 inches long, some of these things. So they were really quite large. And so, in fact, the Cambrian may not be so much of a record of the first trilobite showing up, but the first time that they were actually calcified and preserved as fossils. Before that, they would have been maybe softer materials that just wasn't preserved, you know, maybe in the years leading up to the Cambrian, I guess you could say, in the million or two, yeah, hundred, million or two years uh, before the Cambrian. So they went extinct at the end of the Permian, so these guys are no longer with us. Um, I keep hoping that someday that in the deep sea sort of vessels that we send down to the oceans, that maybe they would potentially find a trilobite, but there's no record of trilobites after the Permian. So that was at 252 million years ago. Um, they are lightly calcified. Now, they're commonly preserved in three dimensions, like you see in fake ops. They're at least in the, in the Devonian variety they are. They're a little bit more compressed when you look at the Cambrian age rocks, like these over here on the right hand side, this one over on the right hand side. But they would have had a a skeleton that would have been a little bit like, um, like uh, it's a, a material, it's called chitin. It's the same type of material, in fact, that forms like roach skins, okay? So if you can hear a crunching when you step on a roach, it would also be the same sound that you would hear when you stepped on a trilobite by accident. You might be screaming after you did that because trilobites tended to have a lot of spines in the Cambrian anyway, uh, but they would lightly calcify as well. So it wasn't all uh, chitin, it was partially calcite as well. And so very lightly calcified sort of skeletons, most of them. Here's another trilobite that shows you the fake ops again. You can actually see the eyes in here as well. <clears throat> this is very interesting because these things are arthropods, right? Arthropods would include the insects and a whole bunch of other organ crabs, lobsters, things like that. So those are the arthropods. Shrimp, that's another arthropod. And the arthropods developed eyes differently and separately from the, the mammals around and actually the fish that were around back then as well. The fish, in fact, had less sophisticated eyes than what the trilobites had. In fact, the, the fish actually had a spot that was sensitive to light just on the top of their head, essentially. But these trilobites they have three-dimensional sort of view all the way around them. You know, they make these 3D cameras these days, and that's a little bit what a trilobite would see. And so if you're looking at a video that's 3D, you can pan around to the back of you to see what's going on there. So that's, uh, uh, I've got one of these actually. So it's Insta360 X2, I think it is, uh, 1X2. So it's an Insta360 1X2. Um, these things, you can look at the shape of the eyes, and so the eyes wrap around. That is a very common strategy that organisms that were prey uh, 
would take because they want to look for where the predators are, Why, right? Uh, so how do you protect yourself against predators? That's the whole idea. Well, you have to have a good intelligence system, which would be this sort of like, you know, having the video all the way around to be able to see anything that potentially could hurt you. What do you do if you're attacked? If you had spines, you could enroll like that, put the spines out, and protect yourself from being munched upon. Is there evidence for that sort of present uh, predation going on in the Cambrian? There certainly is. Um, th this one's actually Devonian here, so the, the predation was still going on in the Devonian here. So that's an enrolled trilobite on the right-hand side here. Okay, let me, you know, we're talking about fossils, and this is a body fossil, so I might as well tell you a little bit about you know, trilobites. Trilobites are incredible, okay? Trilobites are... Um, well, let me put it this way, trilobites, right? So there are three lobes to a trilobite. There's a plural lobe on one side, there's an axial lobe or that runs right down the middle, and a plural lobe on the other side. Well, what are the plural lobes, right? You, Well, that's what the legs were underneath, and also the gills. And so the gills were right along where the legs are, and so it would be able to respirate that way. And it's also got this large area in the, in the front there, part of the cephalon, the cephalon just means the head region of a trilobite. So the eyes were kind of attached right there to the cephalon. And there were pieces where the trilobite could actually shed part of its skin, its exoskeleton, if you will, on a yearly basis, perhaps, to be able to like grow larger. And so otherwise, if it had a fixed skeleton, it would be, you know, like not un unable to grow, essentially. So that's not a good strategy for many organisms, right? So they actually have what they call sutures that run along the edge of the eye and would allow that part to shed off. And then so the animal could escape from its own skeleton, very carefully run around for a couple of weeks and then calcify a new skeleton. And so on a yearly basis, they would do something we call molting. Well, that's what modern, uh, modern crustacea do the same thing. And so they molt for a certain period of time. Maybe you've heard about soft-shell crabs. Soft-shell crabs do that in, let's say, the, uh, the Potomac uh, River in, in that area, so the, uh, the Chesapeake Bay area. So soft-shell crabs will shed their skeletons, and during that short period of time, the crabbers will go out and try to catch as many crabs as they can because they know that when you buy those things, you don't have to crunch through this, like, really you know, coarse sort of skeleton that they would actually secrete later on in their life. Um, so with that, you have trilobites, you have the three lobes, and then they also have three parts. They have a cephalon, they have the axial section in the middle, or they, we call it the thoracic sex, uh, section in the middle, and then there was something we call the pygidium or pygidium at the very end, and that's the tail part of a trilobite. And so all of those pieces would have to be shed off in order for this thing to grow. And it would grow longer through age. And so uh, phacops grew up to maybe four or five centimeters in length, maybe maybe a little bit larger than that, some of these things. Uh, they find these very commonly in Morocco. And so in Morocco, uh, the trilobites from there. And they also get counterfeited too. So you have to watch if you're buying a whole trilobite like this. What it means when you have a whole trilobite, that thing got buried, okay? That's how it was preserved. This one was actually preserved in an enrolled sort of structure, in an enrolled sort of position like that, um, which is pretty wild. But most trilobites aren't preserved that way. In fact, most trilobites are preserved as parts. So we call these things sclerites. So sclerites are the pieces that are left behind when an organism would shed its skeleton. In this case, you can see the labrigine, labrigina, and so those are called the free cheeks, in other words. And so you'd get the crinidium, that's that central part of the cephalon. And then on top, it looks like it would be uh, like a helmet on top of a brain, but in fact, it's actually protecting the gut. <laughs> of this animal. And so this thing would actually be able to graze on the sea floor with the hypostome as a little plate at the bottom of it. And the glomella would actually cover the stomach areas and the digestive sort of areas. And, and so that is the trilobite right here. And so there's a few special trilobites that are out there. I want to show you some of those in just a minute here, but these are parts that would be left behind from a molting trilobite here. So that's the pygidium or the pygidium. My advisor was a Brit, and so they call it pygidium when you're in Britain, apparently. But most people in the United States call them pygidium, 
subpagetium free cheeks on the on the cheek parts out here, and they have the spines on them. And the glabella has a, usually a sort of like plow in the front of it here, where these things could actually go through the sediment. And in fact, when they did that, they actually left marks behind as trace fossils, like Rusophycus is one of those. Um, so that's a trilobite right here. I'll show you another common body fossil, especially in the Paleozoic, and that's what we're going to get into. We're going to talk about the Cameron Explosion. We're going to talk about the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event, and then we're going to lump pretty much everything, and most of the rest of it anyway, into the uh, Middle Paleozoic and then the Late Paleozoic. These are the sort of animals that you find there. So trilobites, fairly common all the way through the Paleozoic. More common in the Early Paleozoic, but still they're around all the way to the end of the Permian. And uh, this is a, a brachiopod. It's another type of animal that you would also see. And so they made their skeletons out of calcite. And that calcite, in fact, would be something that's bilaterally symmetrical in between this way through the valves. And so you can actually see the hinge that's towards the back on this. Well, you can't see it, but it's behind this thing. And so the valve itself has two halves to it. And in between the two halves, that's where the plane of symmetry runs through a brachiopod. It's different from that as to, opposed to a bivalve. Bivalves are a type of mollusk, and they probably both evolved from worms at some point. The brachiopods are actually related to a group called the pheronid worms. And bivalves, nobody knows exactly what kind of worm it was related to, but it was probably something that had parts of a shell on it at some point. So either the monoplacophorans or the polyplacophorans were the ancestral uh, types of lineages that would have led to a bivalve. So brachiopods here, they, they lasted from Cambrian. They're still around today, in fact. Uh, if you were to go to places like the uh, Mediterranean Sea, where there have been shipwrecks and things like that, maybe a, maybe a jar or a jug falls to the sea floor. Inside of that jug, very commonly, you will find brachiopods. On the rocky shorelines of, of Scotland, you will find brachiopods. Uh, if you went to New Zealand and, and uh, Australia and you flipped over a rock, very commonly, you might see a brachiopod there as well. So brachiopods are still around in very, usually cold water sort of settings these days, but the ancient ones were around in the fairly warm water and secreted their skeletons out of low magnesium calcite, CaCO3. Uh, they got two valves, so the valves are actually the shells, so the two shells would fit together along a hinge line and then articulate and open up enough to be able to expose a feeding structure which is inside of this, and probably 90% of the volume of that animal is its lophophore. So the lophophore curls up like this inside of that shell and then extends outward and filter feeds through material. And so it sucks current waters through the shell. And along that commissure, the commissure is open up just enough to allow this thing to filter feed and to also be able to respirate. And so they actually had gills as well. And of course, they could re release their gametes through, the, uh, through this uh, sort of opening as well. So that's what happens in a brachiopod. They're pretty simple, okay? They had kidneys, they had reproductive organs, and they also had a feeding structure and a gut, but they didn't even have a blind anus. They had to, oh gosh, how do you say this? They had to poop out of their mouth, essentially. Uh, so that, okay, this is going to make, I'm sure, some comments out there okay, on, on YouTube, but that's what brachiopods did. They have what they call a blind gut, okay? So it ingests the food, it, it, it dissolves the food essentially, uses it for nutrition, and then gets rid of the excrement through the same sort of opening, if, if you will, uh, at the end of the lophophore. So the lophophore guides everything into a mouth. Uh, so this is a type of brachiopod here that's called a spirifer. They got kind of sophisticated, okay, in the middle part of the of the uh, Paleozoic, this one actually had a calcitic sort of spiral that it would mount that lophophore on and give it some structure. So uh, it would kind of protect that sort of uh, animal, you know, the, the feeding structure. Um, okay, so there are certain varieties of brachiopods that are present today in places like in mudflats in, uh, in the Philippines, I think it is. And it's the only country I know of where people actually eat brachiopods. They eat the, 
not the lophophore, but they actually eat what's called the uh, the pedicle, which is a sort of foot that extends out of the brachiopod and anchors it into sediments, whatever sediments in. Well, the pedicle on these things are called lingulids. They're one of the oldest species on Earth. Well, they're one of the oldest mm, families on Earth. Let's put it that way. A lingulid would live, and when it's it's high tide, they could extend out and then filter feed like this. And then when low tide comes around, they would draw back in on that pedicle, which kind of anchors them and allows them to be pulled in, essentially, into the sediment. Um, anyway, that's that's kind of what a brachiopod looks like uh, from the inside, okay? So the lophophore would wrap around that sort of structure. Um, other types of animals that existed, now circulated worms didn't go all the way back to the Cambrian, but they were pretty early. These are some late Holocene ones right here that you see in this image anyway. These are ones I've actually studied in Jamaica, and so these are serpulids that today are exposed about a meter above sea level. That's kind of an interesting story. Why were there animals a meter above sea level when they're sea-loving animals, right? Um, well, it's because there was a tectonic uplift, okay, and it killed all the worms when that happened. So that happened about 1,500 years ago here. Um, but here's a photograph of these worms. They're 1,500-year-old worms. Puts them into the market of being, you know, related to fossils. They're not subfossils, although they're the same living species that are around today in the Caribbean. They're made out of aragonitic materials, and so they're a they're a tube worm essentially. And they're really kind of wild looking, actually. If you were to see a tube worm, these things actually would extend and have sort of a, a feather, if you will, that that's exposed. Well, it's a feeding structure. Not unlike a loaf of four in some ways, and yeah, they're not quite the same. They're not the same as feronid worms, but they're not far off. But they would actually be able to like uh, catch things, essentially, like protists and maybe some microbes that would float along in the water column and be able to feed out of water uh, that way. And so these things are uh, made out of aragonite, just like the the cephalopods that we talked about earlier, made out of aragonite. They're metastable at Earth's surface. And so uh, aragonite's actually a warm water stability is where it actually uh, has its greatest stability and it will actually recrystallize back into uh, calcium carbonate. So recrystallization is very common for animals that are made out of aragonite. Um, the other thing that happens to them, of course, is they can actually become not just recrystallized, they can actually go into solution and be dissolved fairly easily. So there's a high rate of dissolution for aragonite as well. Modern corals are made out of aragonite as well. Here's one that's somewhere around 90,000 years old here. And this is in that same sort of area. It's when sea level was about seven meters higher than it is today. And through this process of inversion, you can take aragonite, something that a lot of sea creatures make their skeletons out of. Even bivalves have layers of aragonite in them. That's going to recrystallize through time into calcite. So calcite's much more stable. At least low mag calcite is more stable. And so when I say low mag calcite, what do I mean? I mean low magnesium content in the calcite. And so less than 15%, let's say. Um, so the other thing that happens to organisms like snails, which are made out of aragonite as well. Snails go into solution so easily. And in fact, they're more commonly preserved as these sorts of features, which the snail shell itself will dissolve once it's buried very commonly. And it leaves behind the impression of what was inside of the snail. And those things are called stein cairns. And so a stein cairn is actually a, uh, it's the mold it's not the mold. The shell was the mold. This is an internal cast of what would have been inside of that shell. And so on the left-hand side, those are turritellid uh, gastropods. And on the right-hand side, I have no idea what that is, but it's from Jamaica as well. So you get things like uh, stein cairns, even in places that are tropical, uh, surrounded in this case by uh, aragonitic, um, with aragonitic shells going, what you have there instead is preserved the calcite around it. And so that's calcite. And muddy materials filled in the shell, obviously, over here on the left-hand side, before the shell itself had dissolved. Um, if we think about fossilization, you can get burial, you can get permineralization, the replacement of the minerals. 
You can actually have ghosts sort of like matrix left behind when things recrystallize. Uh, you can also dissolve the shell and then make a cast of that shell. Um, you have a mold that's left behind when you dissolve the shell and the cast is actually the material that fills in that mold in. And so um, in this whole diagram, in this situation, starts on the lower left down here and you can see that it's buried. Sometimes they're recrystallized. Sometimes you get an external mold. Sometimes you get an internal mold. Nothing that you need to worry about, but know that there is this sort of process by which you can actually replace the shell material, even in bivalves and things like that. So uh, the complete dissolution is the last sort of phase for most of these things. Um, so here is the, the general order about how things are preserved. You could have bones that are unmodified. You have bones that are recrystallized. You can have bones that are replaced. You could permineralize them with other materials like silica. You can take a cast and a mold of those things as well. Um, so you can follow down each one of those columns. It shows you what the original hard part material can turn into. And so with muscles and tissues, very commonly, not very commonly, rarely you can see here, these things are never preserved, okay? Very, very rarely they can be desiccated or carbonized, okay? So, um, so in other words, the light green color without any stippling on it indicates that it's relatively rare. The things that are common in the dark green. So those are the ones to pay attention to here. So uh, soft-bodied organisms, you might get them carbonized at some point. Leaves, you'll carbonize those. Uh, for wood, you can carbonize that as well. You can replace it with silica, obviously, making petrified wood or silicified wood, right? You can permineralize it as well. You, it doesn't have to be silica, be other things as well. Um, you can actually have calcareous shells, and there's a whole bunch of different things that can affect those. Arthropod carapaces, that's the skeletons of things like like the trilobites. Okay, what happens to the sclerites? What happens to the whole trilobites? Um, and then for phosphatic shells, there's a whole nother series of things that can happen to them as well. I wouldn't say to memorize this, but just know that you can replace pieces either with silica or with pyrite, or you can carbonize soft tissue sometimes, and sometimes you can actually have something called inversion, which would take an aragonitic shell and turn it into calcite. And then you could also turn things into the internal molds, which are the steinkerns. That's the important part. Here's one of these silicified worms again, like you saw at the very first of this. There are a couple different specimens here. Um, I went ahead and tumbled some of this material. It makes beautiful stones uh, once, they're, once they're tumbled. But this is a lot like petrified wood. Now, it is not the same area where these things... These were actually in deep marine sort of settings where they lived and died, were buried in the sediment, and then silica came along and replaced most of the skeletons of these things. And the skeletons are the white rings, essentially, around what was an infilling of darker material. In that darker material, in fact, you find a lot of, of uh, a mineraloid called a kerogen. So kerogens are actually a source for oil. And so that gives us a good indication that, in fact, these things are associated with methane seeps or oil oil seeps perhaps as well. Here's a photograph from Petrified National, Petrified Forest National Park. These are logs that eventually were buried at some point in volcanic ash and then also clays and the clay and the volcanic ash surrounded these things and then the silica from the clays and from the volcanic ash would have flowed through that wood and replaced the cellular structure. That's pretty cool. You can see the bark on these things. Uh, the internal structure is commonly preserved as well. So you can actually, in thin sections, see what the cells look like. Um, so silicification is actually very, very precise in how it comes along and replaces the original material in these things. This is just a fun shot here to show you students on a field trip. But uh, in in other types of preservation for woody materials like this, plants. Now, we've not got to plants yet. We're not going to get to plants until we get into the Devonian. But the Devonian were some of the first land plants. And we will get into plants in great detail when we get into the Carboniferous. Carbonization. 
they named it the Carboniferous because there's so much carbon carbonation going on, carbon carbonization going on in the Carboniferous that it replaces the entire forests essentially and turns them into coal. And so carbonization is that process. And the process, it doesn't actually turn it into coal. It actually takes all of the fats away. It takes all the volatiles away. And it leaves behind the one thing that's common for all living creatures. And that that, that is that they have carbon. And so coal is made out of carbon. And so in this case, this leaf is made out of carbon. It's, it's not just the impression of the leaf. It's the actual carbon that was in that leaf that got preserved. The lipids, the carbohydrates, the proteins, those have all gone, but it left behind the carbon. So here you can actually see a leaf impression here. So all those other things tend to like degrade and eventually you're just going to be left with the carbon. Um, that leaves us that takes care of pretty much of most of the body fossils. Let's take a look at trace fossils very quickly. And I show you this because this is kind of a local interest, I guess I could say. Um, if you know where the art museum is in Springfield, the art museum has a, an amphitheater that's at the uh, west end of the uh, art museum. And in that amphitheater, they use a facing stone on the stage area. It's called the Northview Formation. The Northview Formation is a fine sandstone. And in the Northview Formation, you find a lot of burrows. So burrows are the tracks that are, or the trails that are left behind by an organism that was crawling through the sediment, looking for something to eat. It would be actually crawling and then using peristalsis, it would like make its body rigid, propel itself in through the sediment, sniff, sniff around for some carbon to eat, some sort of food, if you will and keep going. It would keep pushing its way through the sediment. And so this is a, a particular variety of trace fossil here called uh, Scleratuba missouriensis here. And so these things are burrows from the Northview Formation. It's a mid-Mississippian age rock, lower Mississippian age rock. And it is a, uh, it's a trace fossil. We only know that it was probably a worm that made this track, but we don't know what kind of worm that it was because they don't exist anymore. We don't know of any backfill burrows that are exactly the same that you see with Scleratuba missouriensis here. But that's what the burrows look like on top view here. And so that is a type of trace fossil. Here's what it looks like in a side view here as well. Um, and so they're more round, I guess, but you can see how these things had a behavior where they would crawl through the sediment in search of food. And in fact, that's just one variety of, of creature that was crawling around. Here you can actually see Sclera tuba in cross section and you can see the backfill burrows or you can see little segments across those things. But then down here on the lower right hand side, you can actually see a separate trace fossil called Zophicus. And Zophicus, in fact, was something that had a sort of appendage that would try to look for something to eat by moving through the sediment in order to try to capture something, we think, anyway. That's one of the hypotheses, anyway. So a lot of people think that Zophicus was looking for some of these worms to eat. And so it could have been a predator, in fact, that left that worm tube behind, that sort of trace behind. So that's Zophicus down here. In the lower part. They also call it a rooster tail fossil for obvious reasons here. It looks like the feathers on the on the hind end of a rooster. So um, when we talk about uh, these species, notice that they also have the binomen, right? So uh, it still applies to things like trace fossils. And in this case, we call them ichnospecies or ichnogenera. Uh, so those are two ichnogenera right here that are exposed in this photograph. Um, Zophicus and Scleratuba missouriensis. So I promised you a look at what a trilobite uh, trace fossil would look like. That's what this is. This is Cruziana. I think Rusophicus is another one. Rusophicus may be slightly different, but Cruziana is this idea that you would have the, the legs kicking up sediment and leaving behind kind of a furrow in the middle part and then kicking up the, the material or the sediment, seafloor sediment onto the side there. That's Cruziana right there. You can even see a resting trace for that trilobite down here at the end of that trail. It could be that something came along and ate the thing at the end of that. Nobody knows for sure, right? Because we're only seeing 
I think in this case, we're looking at the bottom part of Cruziana here, but I'm not quite sure. But that's Cruziana. That's a nickname species right here. Okay, so, okay, if we get into the idea of eyes and evolution, so there are different lineages that developed eyes. Bivalves had eyes, and well, they had primitive eyes around the mantle area uh, near where their openings were. So a bivalve is like this, where the, the symmetry is in between the valves, and they open up like that. And so along their hinge line, along here, growing outward in, in a series of rings, essentially, that you would have in the shell. So you would lay down another uh, layer outside of that. Well, the mantle is responsible for that, and the mantle actually had light-sensitive areas. Um, well, they don't want to expose themselves if there are predators around, so they want to know what's around them. Um, the other thing, trilobites are actually arthropods, and so arthropods would have developed eyesight as well. Brachiopods, I don't think, had eyes, but certainly the, uh, the, bri the bryozoans had eyes, and then also the cephalopods developed very distinctive eyes. And so they arose in several lineages, not related to one another. We don't know of any worms that have eyes, but I, I, they may have some eyes, some of these things. They may have light-sensitive organs anyway. But a lot of people, when you talk to creationists, okay, well, they, they like to regard themselves as being somewhat scientific about the things that they discuss. But in fact, they've came up with this argument. It's like, well, it's just too complex to understand. And that's not a very good argument, okay? <laughs> when you have several lineages in which the same function arises, that means there was a need for it and there was something driving it toward that end. And so uh, complexity in and of itself is not a good argument for developing eyes. And so eyes just aren't that complex that they couldn't develop in multiple lineages. And the ones that we have, in fact, are related to the amphibians that developed from the fish. And so the fish were first, and then the amphibians, and then the reptiles, and then the mammal-like reptiles. And the next thing you know is like, well, we're mammals. And so that's where we get our eyes from. Not from the trilobites like this, okay? Um, so it arose multiple times in evolution. So that brings us to the end of this lecture for now. Uh, we've already kind of talked about the various mechanisms for evolution already. We talked about genetic drift, and we talked about other types of, uh, of uh, you know, mutations and other sorts of things that you can get. We haven't really talked about speciation yet, but that's coming still. And I'm running out of time, so I've got to get like four lectures done tonight. So you're going to see me in the same shirt for the next three lectures here. But uh, this is the first one right now. Anyway, that's it for now. These are the fossils. This is how they're preserved. That's the materials that preserve them. There are the different kinds of fossils, like trace fossils and body fossils. We can have original hard parts. We can permineralize those original hard parts, or we can replace those original hard parts with other materials. And then lastly, uh, you can actually permineralize them and turn them into silica, or you can turn them into pyrite, or you can carbonize them and turn them into films, essentially, if they were soft tissues. And you can see the trace fossils, right? We just covered the trace fossils, so I won't go into detail on that, but... But that's it for the fossils for now. Next, we go on to the Cambrian, uh, the Cambrian explosion, they call it. It's also called the Cambrian radiation. So they both show up when you look at like a Wikipedia page for this. But in fact, the Cambrian explosion was probably one of the most important time periods on Earth. And so we're going to look at that. And it's only been the last 10% of geologic time. So anyway, stay tuned. I'll talk to you in just a few minutes now. Bye now.